Now let's take a look at the agenda for today. First, we will talk about exactly what types of emergency disasters you might face as a person living in California. Mr. Do David Lopez, client advocate of Alta California Regional Center, will be providing us with that information. David has been speaking on the topic for a significant number of years, uh, both to uh, self-advocates as well as to regional, regional center staff. So he will be able to provide us with quite a bit of information and some personal experiences as well. Next, we will have Fred Keplinger of the Redwood Coast Regional Center. Uh, Mr. Keplinger is no stranger to emergency preparedness. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Keplinger uh, has been a first responder uh, as a retired police officer for many, many years. So he comes to us with quite a bit of experience uh, and he will be providing a lot of information today uh, regarding, the, uh, regarding emergency management. Uh, Tiffany Swan of San Diego Regional Center also has a number of years of experience working in the regional center system. Uh, she has worked as a service coordinator and has had many opportunities to work alongside people um, receiving regional center services on uh, just exactly what types of steps to take to make sure they are prepared for an emergency. Tiffany will be presenting on batteries, go kits, and the Everbridge system to make sure we all understand how these things work. Finally, I will be letting you know what the regional centers are doing to help people serve and providers get started with emergency preparedness planning. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to David Lopez. Thank you. Thank you, Sid, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am here to talk with you all about what is emergency preparedness. And what we need to think about in emergency preparedness is a series of different plans that you want to put in place in creating one plan. Uh, but uh, depending on your support needs and understanding um, your own personal needs, there might be multiple things you need to consider when creating an emergency plan. Um, so you'll hear more about that today with uh, Fred is going to go into more about emergency planning and what that really means. Um, so you'll hear from Fred and Tiffany that are I think gonna provide you some great resources when it comes to uh, those type of topics, but I'll touch on this a little bit. So steps you wanna take to make sure that you are safe before during and after an emergency or any natural or a natural support uh, disaster. So one, a couple of things that, you know, during a uh, current survey that I was able to review with some information, uh, what I've learned is that four out of five Americans around, um, around the subject of disaster preparedness who live around the, the uh, uh, the possibility of disasters. They live in an area that could be uh, uh, considered a natural disaster. So if somebody lives in the, like a mountain area where forest fires could be a possibility. Uh, what I found very interesting is when you look at 71% of people admit to not having a detailed emergency plan in place in the event of a natural disaster. And I think that's a very serious and critical thing that we need to continue to take seriously. Uh, no matter where you live, even if you live in a rural area like the mountains or if you live in the city, um, you definitely want to know your disaster plans. And I think, uh, or, or you want to know how to create your own personal disaster plan and, and get to know your community, get involved with some community disaster plannings as well. I know first responders do have uh, forms of exercises that you can participate in and volunteer your time for. Uh, to uh, be a part of those disaster plannings. And then there's uh, a lot of great resources and apps available to you to help you create your own disaster plan. There's a uh, disaster plan. There is, seems to be a lot of tools when it comes to disaster preparedness. Um, one of the other things that is uh, what I find is most interesting is that people, um, there's very few people that are prepared. I think 16% uh, of folks 
have admitted to being prepared in the event of disaster. So you definitely want to increase that number and you can start by being a part of increasing that number and being a part of creating your own plan. Um, you know, I think the more you know about your own community and your own personal plan, practicing with your family, practicing with uh, neighbors, practicing with people that you feel comfortable with, the more, the more you know about creating your own plan, the higher the percentage goes in terms of more people being prepared. The more you're prepared, the less you're going to be scared. And that's one of the things that when I've done disaster preparedness trainings for a lot of our uh, folks here at Alta, um, the, that's one of the things we always talk about. The more you're prepared, the better off you'll be in the event of a disaster. Um, so some of the things you want to think about as we are going to venture into this a little bit more is making sure that you practice your own escape plan. Uh, knowing your exit routes in your community, where you currently live, and, and how many ways do you have to get out of your current area uh, in the event of a disaster, and start talking about people who can help you when it's time to escape. That's one of the things I think that is one of the biggest things in disaster preparedness that we talk about is getting to know your neighbors, getting to know your community. And so that's one of many ways because as as much as like, for example, I have a big family and um, I've got a lot of people I could reach out to, but my family is spread it out, you know, throughout the greater Sacramento area. So um, I'm not going to call an uncle who I know that lives in uh, El Dorado uh, while I live in, you know, Antelope in one of our other local areas here in Sacramento. That's, that's a pretty good distance, but I will uh, get to know my neighbors and get to have contact numbers to people that are close to me in the event that a disaster happens. Um, my wife and, and my family always talk about disaster preparedness and my wife is a, a big uh, supporter of disaster preparedness and she's actually sat through some of my presentations. And I, I tell you, we got disaster kits all over the house, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but you know, these are kind of things that you want to think about. You also want to think about um, disaster preparedness kits to go and also to keep in your home. Uh, as we know, prime example would be the epidemic of a COVID of COVID nineteen. The way it, the way it uh, happened, it affected everybody in a different way, individually and in your community. Uh, I, I bet you, if we had an opportunity to ask all of you how it affected you and how it affected your community, I bet you guys could all share a story to that. Uh, one one thing that really surprised me with the COVID-19 on my end when I was taking a look at how it was, how it was affecting uh, the community was, you know, work-wise, you know, we learned that a lot of remote stuff uh, like this is happening. A lot of webinars, a lot of uh, doing work uh, remotely, um, a, lot of, a lot of businesses went that direction. And, and even in your community, uh, a lot of meetings happening on, on uh, Zoom and, and Facebook and there's just a lot of technology that's being used now due to the impact of COVID. And also what's uh, quite interesting to me is that uh, during the time of COVID at the beginning, I found it very surprising that toilet paper was the biggest, uh, uh, kind of a big resource that a lot of people were uh, gathering at the stores. And I remember that time and the impact that it had on me personally, my family and the community. So these are things you wanna think about. Um, you know, COVID was a big impact. So you definitely want to start creating not only disaster kits when you have to up and go, but you also want to think about creating them while you're in your home in the event that you couldn't leave your home because not all disasters require you to leave the home. Some of them require you to be confined to your home. So you want to make sure you have all the different items. You also want to make sure include that, make sure and include that into your plan. Include the discussions of the items that you need, where you're going to gather them, the people you're going to talk to and who you're going to be contacting in the event of a disaster. For example, if you have to leave, one of the biggest things that we discuss is creating a list of numbers of close people that you can contact and let them know that you're safe and getting to know where your disaster centers are in case you have to leave your home and maybe you live further away from an aunt and uncle or a mom or dad that uh, you're in your own community and don't really have that much family or natural support around you, but you're going to a disaster, uh, disaster preparedness center to keep yourself safe, you want to make sure you have uh, those high priority people that you would reach out to and say, hey, 
you know, uh, Sydney, I, I'm okay. David's okay. He's he's going to be fine. Uh, you know, I've got enough medications and I've got enough food in my backpack to be okay for a few days. And you know, the disaster center is going to have people hand out foods. So these are things to really think about when you're creating your emergency plan. Next slide, Sid, please. So some of the things that we want to look at when we focus on disaster preparedness is really looking at some of the current disasters that could hit the greater California area. When you think about earthquakes, you know, yeah, earthquakes, we, ne we never know when an earthquake is really going to happen. Depending on where you are in California, you know, uh, the greater California area is prone to earthquakes and there's never a time, you know, that they can announce and say, well, we suspect an earthquake that's going to happen, you know. Uh, they just kind of happen. So it, it really getting to know each disaster that in your community that you could be prone to. Earthquakes, I think practicing uh, safe um, uh, routines to stay under uh, solid um, foundations so that way when things start falling, nothing falls on you and that you're safe. Uh, how, learning how to, if you're in a wheelchair, learning how to lock your wheels um, in, in some events of some disasters, uh, so that you're not going to slide around or put your, you know, be slidden into some form of a danger. Uh, high winds, power outages. I think uh, California is very um, uh, prone to the power outages. I don't care if you live in Southern California or Northern California. Uh, power outages can happen at any time, and they can happen without even any warning. Uh, you know, we could be watching TV or we could be doing you know, things on a daily basis and all of a sudden the power goes out. So we wanna make sure we have things like flashlights and other things available to you. Uh, the pandemic and epidemic, uh, those are things that, you know, like COVID-19 is what I just talked about. Those are things where you wanna make sure that you have essential items in your house in the event that you have to be confined in your home. Um, you know, and also with the other things like flooding, I know that, California is really big on flooding in terms of uh, uh, when it rains a lot. And actually, when, in Sacramento here today, when I was coming to work, it actually did rain. And, uh, you know, the landslides and things like that could be an issue in the Sacramento area because we haven't had received rain in so long. And that's even in California. I know that uh, in the Bay Area, they're getting hit with some rain. And I believe some areas in Southern California are also getting hit with some rain. So we know after so much uh, time of not having rain, we could be uh, in the position of experiencing some possible mudslides depending on where we live. And so those are some things to really think about, you know, um, uh, you know, heat waves. Again, I don't know how many times we all hear uh, emergency services notifications talking about heat waves. We hear it on the news. You know, you don't want to go mow your lawn in 110 heat. Um, you don't, you don't want to really do anything but stay inside and stay indoors and try to keep as cool as possible. Um, so those are, are critical things to think about when uh, you're talking about different disasters, you know, and, and so it's really good to be involved with any kind of training. Uh, you guys are all involved in today's webinar, which I think is awesome because it just shows the importance that I believe everybody has on their mind disaster preparedness. And I know that a lot of the information we will share that some of you are going to go share in your own communities. And this is really good to have uh, everybody involved here to talk about disaster preparedness. And so I'm going to hand it over to my next panelists and let them expand a little more on some of the things that we talked about just in these couple slides. So Sid, uh, if you'd like to pass it on to, I believe, uh, who's next, Fred? Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, due to an unforeseen immediate circumstance, uh, Mr. Keplinger is not able to join us. However, I will go uh, present his slides that um, actually uh, focus on the five steps of emergency management. The first step that we will be talking about today is prevention avoiding a problem. Um, the best way to avoid a problem or prevent the problem is to try to plan, develop eva evacuation plans. Um, and as David has mentioned, evacuation plans uh, include 
um, the exit routes um, that you would want to um, use in case of, a, in, of an emergency. Uh, and also um, alternate exit routes as well. So we encourage uh, individuals living in group living settings, uh, residential facilities, homes funded by regional centers and providers to develop plans to evacuate the home uh, as soon as possible. Um, and again, to um, also develop backup plans. Um, and those come in very handy. For example, if there is structural damage or damage to the home and you've always planned to go out of the sliding glass door uh, connected to the living room, but uh, this particular event involved uh, a barrier blocking that exit. So it's good to have a different alternate route and to have practiced that plan uh, numerous times. And I think the recommendation that I've seen is at least once every six months, practice the plan, practice the alternate routes, practice um, as much as possible. Um, but again, at least every six months to try to make sure that it comes to you naturally during an event. And the more you practice, the less nervous you will be uh, when an actual event does occur or if an actual event does occur. occur. Um, so for residential providers, um, you know, it's uh, important to work with your staff um, to work on training people and how to get out of the house um, and trainings on how to lead people to safety. Um, for individuals, living with family or independently. As David has mentioned, you know, getting to know your neighbors, um, you know, being able to develop some relationships um, with neighbors, with people close by, because relatives may not be um, in the immediate area. So it's, it's really good to be able to have people that can, um, that can step in and assist you or can check on you in case of an emergency. Um, the regional center emergency coordinators have been working with counties uh, on em emergency operations plans and hazard mitigation plans. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, towards the end of the webinar here about the regional center emergency coordinators and the great work that they're doing. Uh, but they have um, been working on a larger scale in you know, ensuring that the counties are aware of people with developmental disabilities and the needs in regards to emergency preparedness. So the next step of the five steps that I'd like to talk about today is mitigation, reducing the chances um, to reduce the chance of an emergency happening or reduce the damaging effects of unavoidable emergency. So mitigation basically has to do with, for example, if there is um, a lot of debris or trees um, that could be um, dangerous uh, because of the way that they're um, creeping up on the home or in the territory, the yard, or whatever the case may be. Um, clearing those trees away from the house, uh, that's mitigation. That's, you know, creating an environment uh, to make a disaster less bad. Um, and so that's really what mitigation has, you know, really has um, the, the whole purpose of mitigation is you can't always prevent any, an emergency. Um, you can't always pre prevent a disaster, um, as we know. Um, but if, um, you know, if we're taking the right steps to make sure that, um, that for example, with flooding, uh, to make sure that um, the lines, uh, water lines are, you know, secure and taken care of, um, things of that nature, could be 
really, really helpful in regards to mitigation. Preparedness, getting ready. Um, you know, actually uh, something that I learned recently uh, while preparing for uh, this webinar is, you know, local law enforcement stations and fire departments um, have practices and plans in place um, when they're notified of individual special circumstances. So, you know, we encourage uh, providers of uh, residential facilities to go and speak to the local law enforcement um, officers, uh, go to the local station and, you know, introduce yourselves and tell them about what it is that you do and who you provide services to and some of the special circumstances that might be involved um, in the persons that you provide services to. Um, so what they uh, often do is they note these, uh, note this important information, keep it on hand. And then when, if there's a call or a situation, uh, these individuals will be able to have access to that important information um, when they are in your area or when called out to, um, to support you. Um, another important thing that you could do is, as David mentioned, uh, make a kit of essential items. Uh, go kits, uh, they're often referred to. Uh, something you can keep really close by an exit, um, kind of out of the way, but available. And Tiffany uh, Swan today is going to go into great detail about emergency kits and what goes in them and what, you know, what would be appropriate and how to actually organize your kit. And some of that, you know, important information will be shared uh, by Tiffany. Um, again, we can't stress this enough, create your own emergency evacuation plan. And that does, that does include alternate routes. Um, and uh, one other thing that is also considered, uh, you know, when we talk about evacuation plans, there's also, you know, shelter in place um, type of plans that need to be um, developed and created as well. So that you know that you have, if you're actually in a situation where you do not have to evacuate, you're actually called on to um, shelter in place that you have the necessary things that you need for two to three days, um, you know, of sheltering in place. And again, practice your evacuation plan, review your shelter in place plans, um, make sure you, like, again, make sure you have the materials handy. Those are all things you could do to get prepared for a, an emergency. The fourth of the five steps of emergency management has to do re with response right after emergency. So what you really want to first off start to do is, you know, make sure you're, you're safe. Uh, make sure that, uh, you know, that the place that you're in, the structure is safe. Um, you know, coordinate resources uh, if you're a provider. Um, you know, calling out uh, someone to look at the structure, depending again on the emergency at hand, but someone to actually come through um, and evaluate and make sure that, you know, everything's safe and it's okay to return home. Um, removing hazards from the area, uh, depending on the actual event. Um, this could be a lengthy process. Um, and it could, you know, take a long time to actually, um, you know, get all of the debris and things of that nature out of the way. But during the emergency, you know, making sure that where you are, uh, you know, in your immediate area is safe, you know, and removing hair, hazards, I should say, from that area. And then watch for Everbridge alerts. And Tiffany today will go over the Everbridge notification system. Uh, and she'll be able to provide you with information 
on how Everbridge works. Um, and she'll be speaking right after me today to be able to kind of go through that information with you. So, um, but it's important uh, for you to watch for those alerts and, um, and to, you know, try to get in contact with people, as we mentioned earlier, that, uh, that, that you build relationships with that, um, that you look out for and that you, and they look out for you as well. And the fifth step of emergency management is recovery, return to normal. First off, we need to start with food, clean water, power, transportation, and healthcare. Those are the things that, you know, typically your local government will make sure that, uh, that the people have uh, first and foremost um, as they start to return to normal after a emergency disaster. Um, however, it's important to note that full recovery takes time. Um, I know I was, you know, speaking to a gentleman recently that was informing me that, you know, um, New Orleans, um, the Hurricane Katrina, um, you know, the actual, uh, just, I, for lack of a better word, uh, the the damage the disaster ca caused was was extreme, and you know this this area New Orleans is, has not been the same since. They're still not totally operational, and definitely not where they were before. And it's been several years. So this is something that we definitely want to keep in mind that. You know, full recovery takes time and, and it's a partnership and collaboration amongst many different outfits and agencies. And um, we'll go over, uh, you know, some of the agencies that emergency coordinators are looking to for information regarding, you know, recovery and how to get back to normal. We'll be looking at that a little bit further on uh, as we move uh, through this webinar. But next, uh, without further delay, I'd like for um, you to hear Tiffany Swan of San Diego Regional Center speak today about, you know, the GO kits and um, portable batteries and actually, you know, the emergency notification systems. So, Tiffany, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Hi, everybody. I think we're can my camera is going to be coming on in just a second. And you guys can see what I'm working on. There you go. Hi, everybody. What a great presentation so far. Um, so what um, I do is I am one of the emergency management coordinators um, that each of the regional centers have on staff. And we work on different initiatives. Um, for our clients, for our vendors, um, and also for our staff here on campus. So the first thing that one of the first initiatives that we're working on are emergency go bags. These go kits are for individuals served by San Diego, or I'm sorry, by the regional centers residing in independent and supportive living situations that are located in high fire areas. So the way that the state separates them our areas, it's called a tier two or a tier three, are these high fire areas. So regional center emergency management coordinators are responsible for outreach to eligible individuals to attend a one hour emergency preparedness training um, conducted by Disability Rights of California. And as of August um, th this year, we've had 112 participants attend the training. Most of them have gotten their bags as well. So the red duffel bag is on wheels. I'm gonna show you it in just a second. Um, each package has large font on the bag with a QR code that you're able to scan and have a video with instructions on how to best use the items that are within the bag. Let me show you. Let's see if I have this. So this is the bag itself. It's a pretty large bag. 
It has wheels on one side because we know that it's pretty heavy to pick up. So there's wheels on one side and then there's a handle. to roll it around with. Inside the large part of the bag, you have a fire blanket. This is used for either um, heat to keep you warm, or you can throw it on the top of a fire to smother a fire if it's a very small fire. A large fire, make sure that you get out. Don't try to put out that fire yourself. Also inside here, are these packages that I was telling you about. Sorry, there's a glare on the screen. So this one says personal hygiene. So it's gonna tell you in large font what is in each one of these um, bags. And then there's a QR code. Sorry for the glare. There's a QR code right here. You scan the QR code and a video will pop up to tell you all about how to use these items. So this one's for personal hygiene. We have lights, um, this is a flashlight, a radio, a charger, a glow stick, a candle. Um, this one's tools and first aid kits. So it talks about a first aid kit, a rope and a multi-tool, a whistle and a compass, gloves and goggles, a pencil and paper, and a sewing kit. And again, each of these have that QR code on them, so it's gonna tell you how to use the items. We have another one you can see in orange that is for shelter and warmth. And then we have one for food and water. This definitely does have water and it definitely does have food in it. And I believe they are good for up to um, three years, but definitely read the package and look at them to know how to um, use each one of these. So as you see, there's a large room in this bag for other items. Some I have other items could be your medication. It could be a change of clothes or multiple clothes. It could be a feminine hygiene products or any kind of undergarments that you need um, on your day-to-day -day basis. It might be an extra sweater that you just make sure that you throw a sweater in there. Um, so you have a jacket. Remember that um, emergencies are not just an overnight situation. They could be a while. So sometimes we say, try to pack for a 30-day concept. It's better to have more items than not to have enough. The last part of this bag I'm going to show you is in this side pocket. Um, it gives you different tips and ideas of what to bring. This is all the items that are already in there. This is some information about who built this bag. And then this is a emergency plan to have. And it goes through different ideas, different things to do, different ways to think about things. And then your emergency plan of who, to, who the contact people to have. It also goes into local contacts like non-emergency police. It talks about hospitals. It talks about your meeting place. And then it talks, it also has emergency contacts that you can cut out and put in your wallet or put in a safe place. And I would say if you have one, make multiples and put them in different areas. Put them all in separate backpacks, put one in a car, anywhere you can think of that maybe you'd want it at the tip of your fingertips. Just stick it over there. So all these items are kind of stuck over in this side of the bag. It's funny because it gives you this, this little bag of personal items. But if you think about it, all of these personal items would probably need to go in their own separate bag because they're pretty large. But these are just items. Copies of IDs, prescription medications. That would include your vitamins, your glasses or your lenses. Some of us wear contacts. Your financial records, sometimes you might need a copy of where you go to, where is your bank, what your bank card numbers are or access to your bank. Cash and your USB port or USB drive with your information on it. A map or your keys, phone chargers. All of these things are just suggestions, but 
you know your your body best and you know what happens in your life the most that's those are the items that you would need think about all the things you use on a day-to-day -day basis and make a list of those items now in an emergency we're going to grab this bag sometimes you have a little bit more time to think about okay i need this or i need that but sometimes you just got to go and it's all about your safety. So if you can, just go. Grab the bag and go. So these bags, let me fix my camera just a second. There's my face again. <laughs> so these bags, um, um, let's see, let me catch up where I am. So remember, these bags um, could be for long periods of time and it's better to plan for longer, not shorter. Um, and these bags you can keep um, in an area near a door or near your escape plan, but make sure that they're not blocking any areas, right? We want you to still have access in and out of your home safely. Um, and some wheelchair users, you need to definitely be able to um, go through different easements without any types of obstructions. So these bags need to be tucked away, but close enough that you can kind of grab them as you're, um, as you're running out safely. Okay, so the, the second initiative that I'm going to talk about um, are portable batteries. You see it on the screen in front of you. Um, it is, oh, we lost our screen share. All right. Oh, it's coming back. There we go. This is the portable battery. This is what they, they all look like. Um, regional centers are working. Um, our regional center has individuals eligible to receive the portable batteries residing in that same type of area. You need to have independent and supported living settings, and you're located in that high fire risk, tier two and tier three. Uh, the individuals rely upon power for their special needs conditions. An example would be the use of a power wheelchair, an oxygen condenser, um, an apnea monitor. Those are just examples. The portable battery program is to support life maintaining and sustaining equipment in the event of a prolonged public safety public shutoff. That's what you might hear as a PSPS when the um, utilities um, um, talk about on the television. They call it a PSPS. That means a public safety public shutoff. Or it might happen that you lose power during a disaster. Um, that's required for the evacuation. So DDS, which is Department of Developmental Services, partnered with the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers, that's C-L-I-L-C acronym, for distribution of the lifetime loan of the portable batteries uh, to the Disability Disaster Access Resources. That's called DDAR centers. Look them up, they've got lots of resources, D-D-A-R centers. Um, they're the ones that are doing delivery, installation, and instructions on maintenance. Um, regional center emergency management coordinators have notified the eligible um, individuals, um, and they have been receiving the batteries intermittently since November of 2022. The third initiative that we've been working on is uh, DDS awarded the American National Red Cross $50,000 to develop emergency preparedness for adult residential facilities and residential care facilities for the elderly. The award is developed and to facilitate training on wildfire preparedness and evacuations. In addition, a two-page flyer to providers and individuals served on preparedness tips um, for before, during, and after a wildfire evacuation. This project is in the development phase. We are in work groups monthly, I'm sorry, weekly with the Red Cross, and we're gathering materials from Department of Public and Social Services, community care licensing, um, and regional centers, um, expectations for vendors. Um, for monitoring and existing providers. So lots more to come on that project with the Red Cross. We're really excited. We're excited about all of these initiatives. They're really fun to work on and they're really, um, they're things that, that have been on the back burner for, for many of years. And we finally were able to put some of them in play um, with the funding. Last thing I wanna talk about 
is our Everbridge notification system. Um, all clients, all vendors, and all regional center staff are automatically enrolled in the Everbridge system that allows regional center emergency management coordinators or maybe the executive leadership team of the regional centers um, to push out text messages or phone calls to specific people of affected areas to notify them of alerts or warnings or something happening in their area. It's a way to share information um, and notify you of um, an oncoming an emergency, uh, maybe um, some sort of power outage, um, maybe um, a wildfire in your area. And then to give you additional information, maybe we can tell you about uh, their available shelters that are open. Um, maybe we can just notify you um, of a shelter in place. Um, maybe we can just give you additional information of contacting 211. Um, some, when you receive the text message or the phone call, it will sound something like a, a normal person's voice. And it will begin typically with, this is an alert of the Everbridge system from, and it will fill in the name of your regional center. And then it will continue on with the message um, that, that that regional center wants to make sure that you're hearing. Please listen to the whole message. And at the end, they're gonna ask you to respond. Sometimes it's press one for yes, or um, just, re just say yes, you've received the message because that information comes back to us and it lets us know that you guys are aware that this is going on. We are able to push them out in different languages. Um, most of the time we can push them out in Spanish, um, but we are able to push them out into other languages if they're identified as um, a person in that area that speaks a different language. So all of these, um, these um, um, activities that we're involved with are, are very fun. They're, they're great different um, ideas that have just been bounced around the uh, regional centers. And we are very excited to keep these going. And any questions about these initiatives, please reach out to your regional center for specific process and their procedures on it. Thank you guys. Thank you very much, Tiffany. So next, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what the regional centers are doing to prepare for emergencies. Uh, but before we really dive into that work, I think it's important to uh, understand exactly how regional centers work. Um, and for some, this may be new information. For others, it may be a refresher. So, but real quick, uh, just a basic understanding of regional centers. So there are 21 nonprofit regional centers throughout the state of California. Um, and they are represented by the Association of Regional Center Agencies, ARCA, in which I'm employed. Um, and the ARCA board, is made up of 21 executive directors of the 21 regional centers, as well as the 21 board president, presidents. So that means there's a 42 member board. Uh, regional centers receive funding from the state of California through the Department of Developmental Services. The money regional centers receive is considered a contract allocation or budget. Um, regional centers are responsible for ensuring that the approximately 400,000 people served are, are re leading independent and productive lives and are making choices and decisions about their lives. Um, so during the fiscal year 20 and 21, California budget, the California budget included 21 positions to address uh, emergency preparedness uh, for the regional center. So that would be one position per regional center. And these are, uh, the title of the position is the emergency coordinator. Um, last fiscal year in 21-22, uh, the state allocated $4.3 million to uh, pr 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 preparation efforts. Basically, um, they would like the funding to support the feeling safe and being safe emergency preparedness information materials that are located on the developmental uh, Department of Developmental Services website. 
uh, provide training and education to regional center emergency coordinators on how to prepare and respond during emergency situations, provides individuals living independently or with limited supports with emergency go kits, and enables the purchase of backup batteries and generators for individuals who are dependent on life-sustaining equipment. So those are the initiatives that Tiffany just spoke of. So during an emergency, uh, the 21 emergency coordinators are, provide, are required to provide notifications and updates to uh, the people served as well as to the Department of Developmental Services. Uh, they're also responsible for uh, um, identifying closures and loss of services, uh, identifying addressing unmet needs of the individuals served in that area, uh, securing emergency supplies, as well as coordinating um, with the Department of Developmental Services and other regional centers on the actual uh, event and being able to maintain and pull people together, maintain safety and pull people together and support them as they go through those, uh, you know, go through recovery um, after the event. Aside from the immediate emergency response, um, the emergency coordinators also support ongoing recovery efforts, specifically assisting individuals returning home, uh, providing information on available services resources such as FEMA assistance, uh, temporary housing, replacement of medical equipment, and educating counties on regional center roles in de developing emergency plans with counties and neighboring regional centers. Now to highlight some of the work that the emergency coordinators have been doing here recently, um, I'd like to kind of just tell you a little bit about this very zealous, very experienced group of 21 coordinators. Um, they are in the process of uh, developing a resource library for that pretty much would cover uh, the entire state. Um, and they are using apps such as uh, the State Parks apps, Disaster Alerts apps, Watch Duty, FEMA again, Zello, and American Red Cross as well. Um, and as Tiffany has mentioned, they are the coordinators are also um, collaborating, collaborating with the American Red Cross in developing materials for residential facilities uh, at this time. Um, then there's also projects that the um, the emergency coordinators are doing, which um, they are collaborating with uh, community care licensing, the Department of Public and Social Services to ensure all emergency preparedness requirements are considered when developing materials. So there's a lot of checks and balances. Uh, in addition to that, uh, regional centers are working diligently on um, getting that materials, the go kits out to individuals that qualify. Um, and also working, as Tiffany has mentioned, with the Disability Rights California Agency on um, the trainings and collaborating on trainings and getting individuals in there uh, to receive their go kits and receive the training on how to uh, prepare for an emergency disaster. Um, in regards to the uh, batteries, uh, as Tiffany has previously mentioned, they're working with the CFILC on making sure individuals that qualify um, receive one of the 450 batteries available uh, statewide um, though for those that qualify. So another current project um, referenced by Tiffany uh, regarding power shutoffs, the PSPS, um, basically is uh, where the emergency coordinators are um, working collaboratively um, and beginning to work uh, collaboratively with the, um, the California Commission, um, California Public Utilities Commission, excuse me, um, to ensure that the individuals that receive regional center services that 
qualify or should qualify for the program um, that they have in place regarding, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the medical baseline uh, program, which would ensure that the issues related to uh, those individuals are highly considered uh, when there is plans for the power shutoffs. So um, it's a process that, um, that the state has used, but we found that approximately 6% or so of our individuals are, are on the list and um, the individuals served by the regional center, I should say, uh, have made the list for the Public Utilities Commission, but we feel like that number should be quite a bit higher. So we're working with them, or going to be working with them, I should say, on um, determining uh, what their criteria is and see if, you know, what, it, what, how, what type of assistance we can provide them with to ensure that they uh, are highly considering our individuals served. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the, the coordinators continue to work with the Department of Developmental Service. They collaborate with Red Cross and many other groups um, and, you know, in developing their own, uh, their own um, plans for their local area, but also developing resources um, for statewide emergencies and, um, and, and resources and connections for statewide emergencies. So for providers that are ready to start planning and are really motivated to make sure you prepare for one of the California disasters uh, that David uh, discussed, um, one thing that we would recommend you do is contact your regional center community services department and tell them what you're hoping to learn, uh, that you're hoping to learn more information about developing plans. Um, they will point you in the right direction and um, they may also consider or may also put you in contact with an emergency coordinator for technical assistance. For individuals receiving regional center services that are ready to plan for California disaster, I would recommend or we would recommend, ARCA would recommend that you start with your service coordinator. Um, sit down with your service coordinator and explain to them what your uh, goals are as it pertains to emergency preparedness planning and see what type of assistance and what type of resources are available uh, with, within the regional center. So in conclusion, I will say first off that uh, thank you very much for joining today. And for those uh, registered, which all of you participants have registered, uh, you will be receiving an email um, that will include today's materials as well as an infographic that would be a quick reference to uh, um, regarding the five steps of emergency management to assist you with planning uh, in the future. Thank you very much again for attending. And I'd like to thank the esteemed panelists uh, for doing a great job and, and uh, please look forward to receiving those materials. Have a good day.